Okay, it's live now. It's live, is it? Yeah. Hi, it's Rob Moore here. Welcome to module four of my brand new online audio, video, business income builder course. I'm only sharing this live to disruptive entrepreneur community members and my fan stroke followers on my progressive Facebook page, so it's a bit of a special treat for you. So module four is finding and securing your first clients or your next run of clients. Without clients, you have no business. And this is gonna be an important module. We've done marketing, we've done setup. Uh, this is gonna be a, what, a nine or a 10 module? Something uh, like that, nine or 10 nine module. Nine and then we're doing at least one bonus. Okay, module. nine module program, and then um, we're gonna give you some bonuses, uh, workbooks with it. All right, um, and this is also, we're in a studio, so we might start and stop a bit, um, but we might have to do a few takes. You can see me looking in the background, we've got Tom and Harry, all the gear. No idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so are we ready? Almost, can you just move slightly okay. for me? It's moved back to number three, which is marketing fundamentals. Yep. So do you want to move it on to module four? If you have any questions, by the way, throughout the whole live feed, please do ask them. Uh, we, found, we found them really useful. We're going to be rolling them into the program. The good questions, of course. So if you've got any questions, let me know. Ready, Rob? Yeah. Four, take one, Mark. Just bear with me. Yep. Yeah. I have to look into this camera, I've been told, but I, <laughs> I, I uh, am talking to you. No, okay, the bar at the bottom tells you how many slides you've got. So yeah. you've got about three slides. So okay. you want to do about 12 minutes on each slide. Okay. 12 minutes on each slide. Tell me where you are, where you're from, where you are in the world, and submit any question you've got on building the, your business and the income in your business. Okay, Rob, in your own time, take it away. Welcome to module four, finding and securing your first or your next run of new clients. Now, there is one-to-one -one client sourcing and one-to-many client sourcing, and they're very different. Now, when you start out, you may be the only salesperson in your organization, or I suppose if you've scaled or you're lucky, you may have one salesperson. And so there's probably going to be a lot of one-to-one -one nature of your selling and lead generation when you start. That's not really that scalable, so I would do one-to-one -one first and then one-to-one, one-to-many later. But the benefits of one-to-one -one are obviously you can build good rapport. You, can, you get to know the objections personally, so you can overcome them. You know, you, you've got, you're in control of the follow-up process. Uh, they feel that they're working directly with the owner of the business, and so that can be very appealing to customers and clients. So when you do one-to-one -one selling, whether it's in their house or you know, whether you get a client to come and visit you, you want to start with the end in mind. And the end should be that you hand over the one-to-one -one selling to a team member or I think we have about 12 people in the sales team, would you say, Progressive upstairs? It seems to grow all the time. Now, I used to do the one-to-one -one selling for Progressive Property when we had Progressive Portfolio Builder. And I'd sometimes go and see the clients. And often if I go and see potential clients, the further I went, the kind of, the more power and control they had over me. Uh, and what I found is if we made them, I say made them, invited them to come and see us, they showed more commitment by coming to see us. And of course, if we can bring them in our offices. Now, when we started, we didn't have an office. We used to meet them at Costa Coffee or somewhere nice um, and say, we just come from the office because the office was a tiny dining room. Uh, where you couldn't even fit a dining table in it, which is quite ironic in my very first house. So you may want to think about bringing them to you to a nice location where they feel comfortable and, you know, it's nice scenery and looks expensive or looks like you've got a real business. I remember one client didn't sign up with us, so they signed up with a competitor. And I actually managed to get hold of them and ask why. And they said when they came to our new office, everything seemed a bit empty and it seemed like we'd only been there two weeks. I mean, it's a big office compared to what we have, but we had only been there two weeks and there's literally a few books and, and nothing and it looked too empty. So you've got that balance between you go and see them, they're in their comfortable environment. And of course, you can build some good rapport there. Um, but the more you have to work for them, the more power and control they're going to have. And therefore, maybe the easier it is for them to negotiate you or maybe to say no, not be committed. Whereas the further they come to see you, the more committed they are. That's a big part of the sales process. So the one-to-one -one and one-to-many sales process, you want to balance between getting them to jump through enough hoops so that they're committed when they get to you versus 
if you make it too hard for them to get access to you, you might be filtering out or disqualifying some people who could become your clients. So how can you do this qualification process? Well, um, before you speak to them, uh, maybe you get them to read some material. Maybe they've already opted in. Maybe they get a few value-add emails from you. They read some material. Maybe they watch a couple of your videos online so there's already a bit of rapport with you if you've got a book and they've read your book. That's good. Uh, and then when they come to see you, they, they know you a bit more. You should probably speak to them on the phone, um, uh, not early in the sales process. And maybe if you have a PA or a virtual assistant that you can pay to do the phone calls for you, they can book the meeting. Then you can have a quick pre-meeting call and then they get to speak to you personally. But this might be like step six in the, you know, in the qualification process. And then you check with them that they're the right fit, and then you book them in to have a one-to-one -one meeting with you. Of course, to make it too hard, you'll never make any money. All right, so, starting with the... Blah, 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 blah. That's a good point to uh, <coughs> drink. Any, any questions for anyone yet, Tom? No questions no? yet. Got about 20 people on there. Okay. So, I'll just carry on as and when. So, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah no, everything all right. So I think you should have a vision and a goal to do one-to-one -one selling for as short a time as possible so that you can grow your business. Because whilst you could probably sell your business proposition, message, vision better than anybody else because it's your business, if you always have to do that, you can't grow it, take it global, you know, spread your marketing wide, hire people, manage people, be a leader if you're too busy selling. But of course, you've got to get some money in the bank to make things, you know, to grease the wheels if you like. So some things you want to do now, in fact, I've had two mentoring sessions I've done this morning with people who are very successful, making you know, hundreds of thousands a year, and they've had to ditch all their hobbies, and they've you know, not really got a balance in life, and they used to love it, and now they're working 10 hours or 12 hours a day um, because they haven't done this, and this part is really easy. Every business owner does it, uh, knows it, most don't do it. You want to systemize and manualize and document eyes and record and productize everything you do so everything that's in your head you know how to overcome the objections the key parts of the message of the selling when to ask for the money when not to ask for the money how long the meetings should be the case studies the testimonials the stories you tell in the experience you've got in your whole life that you bring to this client it needs to be out of your head and written down in checklists and recorded on screen uh, grab cap uh, screen capture so Camtasia's one isn't it we should put that in the resources yeah. putting it on audio so speaking it into dictation software dragon dictation if there are any other good dictation bits of software there's that transcription one Damien sent me rev yeah rev so there are all these simple bits of software most of them free or nearly free where as you are doing your thing so as you are running a webinar you can record it uh, and then people who could sell for you and you could hire can not only watch you doing it, but watch how you do it from behind. So let's say you're doing, running a webinar. Well, you start recording before you run the webinar. You log in, in, where to log in, how to start the webinar. For example, when you go to a webinar, there are two buttons to start the webinar. And it says start broadcast and you press it and you think you're live to thousands of people. But you have to say show your screen, which is the next button. No one told me that when I did my first three webinars and I'm gobbing off for 90 minutes. And no one can see my slides. And then people are messaging me saying, no, there's no slides, and I'm halfway through it, and I don't know where the button is. And then I have a minor flip out, um, obviously, when the mute button is on. Um, you know, I've done live feed videos that I thought have crashed, and I've had a bit of a, a moment, and uh, the live vid feed video is still on. So everything that you've ever learned from the systems and processes and managing the... Um, hardware, software and operations, all the way through to all the nuances of detail you know. For example, scripts for your phone calls uh, and um, a list of objections that commonly come up that you uh, overcome naturally that they wouldn't know how to. A mapped out step-by-step -step process of the first thing to do from them opting in to the 23rd thing for them to do, you know, when, when for example, you're sending them the bank details or sending them the invoice or they're paid and then the pack they get afterwards and the follow-up process afterwards when you do your own sales call or um, you know online presentation face-to-face -face sales um, pitch 
always debrief afterwards. And think, okay, so what did I do well? Get your system out. Did I follow the system? What didn't I do so well? What could I do better next time? Put that in the appendix. Is that system right? Do I need to tweak it a little bit? Even better is you can get your PA or VA to watch in or listen in, take notes and do it for you. Anytime you sell anything, you want it recorded, audio or video, so that your PA or your VA can improve your sales processes. Now, I call this leveraging leverage. A lot of people, if they're smart in business, they will do their doing throughout the week and then maybe on a Friday afternoon they'll spend two hours writing their systems and processes and updating their manual and you know maybe um, talking into the, the device from a, f a few scripts, some things they learned, and then they'll ping that off to the VA or the PA at 5.30 and then they'll ask for an updated manual and updated systems on Monday morning and then they'll check them to make sure that they're right. And the smart person will do that. The wise business owner, they will outsource the outsourcing and leverage the leveraging and they will ask a VA or a PA to be responsible for that. So I like to record my live feed videos into audio. So then we can repurpose the information. I think that was module two, if you remember that. Uh, and, you know, I like to have my, my PA uh, follow me around from time to time and make notes of the things I do in the business that only I can do. So that can be handed over. And we're in a fortunate position now at Progressive Property and Limited Success where... Um, if I go away for a month or two months, the business functions. In fact, um, people kind of like it when I go away for a long amount of time because I'm not getting in their way. I'm not micromanaging them. They get on with their job. We've got all the manuals and systems. Um, I asked my personal assistant, one of my personal assistants today, um, have you got everything in the documents and processes to make it easy for someone to start this business again? And she said yes. Uh, and also... The Marks PA and our MDs PA, so there's two other PAs there, they can do a bit of training as well. So then you have, um, you know, you have this legacy planning, capacity planning, where if someone leaves or you want to go and do something else, you have these systems in place. I mean, of course, that's relevant to every part of your business, not just the one-to-one -one selling process. A few questions for the next question. Okay, am I rambling or is this all right? This is good. Okay. So these are relevant. <clears throat> I'll go up in the relevant order. Yeah. So, would you ever advise using family to help with bookkeeping, etc., who are maybe cheaper and easier to start with but are unqualified? What are the benefits, okay. pros, cons? So, two things, right? Yeah. You just move the bottle out of shot and can you answer the question to this camera as well? Okay. okay. So, I think you should put this in the QA section, not in this bit. Okay. Yeah, just because it's not, it's kind of it's relevant but not so, because yeah. um, I'm going to answer it holistically. So I'll just say I often get asked and put it in there. Yeah. I often get asked, should you hire family, you know, maybe for bookkeeping? Obviously, the cheaper, maybe free. Uh, and, and you know what? There is no right or wrong answer. So we did hire family. Uh, so our first ever employee, we've got about 70 now in-house. We must have over 100 outsourced um, team members, uh, was Mark's mum. And then our second ever employee was my mum, Mark's my business partner. And what we found is it was great because, first off, they would help for free, a few hours a week. Then we paid them, but, you know, they, they didn't need a huge amount of money and they're prepared to, you know, work for you know, pretty low, it's fair to say, wage. Uh, and the upsides of that were they helped us bridge the gap from no staff to two staff. And you know what? The hardest to bridge the gap is no staff to two staff, not 70 staff to 100 staff, because you already get hiring and you have the recruitment processes and all these different areas to to hire people and you know you you're not scared of hiring but that's the you know your first member of staff is the biggest bridge so our mums helped us bridge the gap that was a big upside number two is they cared about us we cared about them so you know no one sort of will help you more or care about your business more or want to do as good a job as your family some downsides you know mark's mum wasn't really a right fit for her role and my mum wasn't really a right fit for her role they were doing it to help us. So in the end, with Mark's mum, it was like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Weekly, Mark would have his mum in tears. Weekly. In fact, I just had this discussion with him today. And, you know, I, I'd have to be like the referee of a UFC fight going in there and getting Mark to speak to his mum in a nice, non-patronising way and asking Catherine to not maybe take it so personally because this is business, this is not about father and something. So the downside is it can put a bit of strain on the relationship. 
Also, if, if you know, Mark's mum, for example, would never be a bookkeeper. And I had a specific question around, should you get your family members to do your bookkeeping? Well, if they can't do it, no. Because if you go to a local business meet, their book bookkeeper's 10 a penny. And they might charge you 12 quid an hour or whatever, and you can just send them all your receipts. There'll be even apps now, just scan all your receipts, send them all through. So do it, but make sure they can do the role and maybe have it as a short-term thing. We did, it worked. For others, they've fallen out with family members and I wouldn't want to be responsible for you having a divorce because I recommended that you should hire family members. Uh, my fiance, Gemma, she worked with me for five years and it was great in so many ways. Her, her previous industry was kind of, you know, I wouldn't say dying, but it wasn't as easy to do anymore. She was working for her parents and they pretty much retired. She came and worked for us because it was a convenient move for her. She learned so much working for Progressive. She loved the growth. Ultimately, it did put a bit of a strain on our relationship because I was managing her for a good few of those years and she weren't going to listen to what I was going to say. And then when she was annoyed with me at work, she would make me suffer at home and deprive me of certain things just to revenge me. If you want to cut that out, you know, you can. <laughs> but it did, it, I mean, we were never going to split up over it because I think our relationship is stronger than that. But it did put a lot of pressure on our relationship. And what happens is you work from eight till six, you go home, you have dinner, and then you're both talking about work. And, you know, and so you're like, Ugh, and, you know, like... Jen would want to complain about a few things about work and I'd feel like she was complaining to me because this is my business. And in the end, we started having these rules we're not allowed to talk about work after 7pm. So then we'd message each other while we're sitting there. She'd send me diary entries. I'd send her instructions and we're sitting there next to each other. Uh, and, then, and, you know, so it worked for five years, but it, it wasn't scalable, sustainable. So help, you, help yourself get over that bridge, yes. If they can do the job, yes. Um, but probably not long term. Got a question about the cost for PA and stuff. Yeah, not, far away. Not massively relevant to this. So if you just want to say, like, we're going to do a breakdown, answer the question briefly, but then if you say there'll be detailed breakdown of sites and costs for this kind of thing, okay. supplementary material. All right, far away. What's the question? The question is, how much should I be paying for a virtual PA? Okay, so I often get asked, I often get asked, how much should I, should I pay for PAs, VAs? And of course, we can take this more generically, how much should I pay for staff? Well, if you are from Scotland, or you're from central London, or you're from New York, it completely um, differs. So you'll pay a lot more for central London wages than you will say Peterborough, which is only 70 miles away. And, you know, you might be able to get, get really low compared to UK wages in, say, Philippines with online VAs. Um, you can pay people per minute now. If you go to local business meets, you can find people who... There was someone who used to go to our local business meet about 10 years ago. She called herself Miss Moneypenny. And she was like your own private sort of James Bond style PA. And you could pay her by minute for transcriptions and, and various different sort of, um, online and, and physical services. So there is no one stock answer to how much you should pay. Um, I do now subscribe to the view that if you really scrimp on that, then you have to accept the fact that you might get a lower quality. And I can think of dozens of examples in our team where if we paid 10 or 20% more, we might have got 50 or 100% better quality because the difference between someone who's average stroke poor in a role and someone who's really amazing the pay difference not at like an md or ceo level because the pay difference can be 10 times but as sort of you know middle manager or a level down the pay difference between a good one and a bad one might only be 20 or 30 percent more but they might be 300 400 or 5 percent better and in the early days we definitely did keep the cost really low on hiring and that course keeps the overhead down but it probably restricted the quality of it. But at the same time, you don't want to pay top money and attract people who aren't top people. So you're back, you're so paying top money for top people, it'll be worth it all the time, but then keep the costs low in sort of maybe more commoditized or productized roles. Now, the great thing about the world we live in now is you can, t you can pay per job. So you can go on Upwork. Did that used to be Elance, now Upwork. You can go on all these sites like Upwork and you can pay for a job. You can get PR companies and you can pay for a project. You can get law firms and you can pay for a, a one-off service. And whereas in the past, maybe you had to have full-time people or retainers, you can essentially pay per job. So we test, don't we, a lot of designers on, say, Fiverr or whatever, and we'll pay them per job. Uh, and then you get to test them, low risk, and if they do a good job, you give them another job and then another job and another job until such time as, you know, you think that they're worth hiring. We'll put all these resources, won't we, on, on the information pack that comes with 
this business income builder course for all these outsourcing websites and these um you know all the all of these um resources that can help you hire progressively without too much increase in your overhead um i've spoken to three people in the last week who can't afford staff and aren't paying them um aren't even hiring people and think that they have to do it themselves and the sort of the small business curse the entrepreneur's dichotomy is well you know we built this business we know how to do it other people don't they'll ruin it they don't care like it's mine no one can do the job as well as me you know i don't want to manage staff and so they just haven't got enough staff i spoke to someone just this morning who's earning a good couple hundred grand a year and she says she's still pulling pints in her pubs and restaurants and she's driving around her restaurants and she's got 120 properties she's brought 24 hmos in the last year and she's netting 200 grand a year. She's probably not paying herself enough. And yet, she hasn't got, even got a PA or even a part-time PA. If she had a part-time PA, even if it was just her own personal stuff, like the gardening, the cleaning, the cooking, and everything else, she'd live right 20 hours a week, and she can afford it. But it's like this mentality that graft is better than craft. But it, it, it's, the, it's the thought process, the strategy, the vision, the freeing of your time so that the ideas are able to formulate and you're able to work on and iterate those ideas that make most of the money, not the digging the hole deeper that you could get someone on eight or 12 pound an hour, depending on where you are in the country or less in the Philippines or wherever. So some things to think about. Cool, next question I'll give you now, but I think you should do this next slide because it's related to both the previous ones. Mm -hmm. So next question is, is there a simple model for how to structure a sale that you would suggest how to structure a sale to give to people? So if you want to do this one about them one to many, okay. and then you can give the structure after you've done one to many and right. one to one. But I'll tell you what we should do in the resources section. Yeah, I've probably got sales processes for various different yeah. things we offer. Of course, a sales process completely varies. You know, if you're selling a pack of peanuts, or you know, you're selling a, yeah. a, a yacht that you're bespoking for Roman Abramovich, which is actually happening right now, that's a very different sales process. Um, but I'll try and dig out a couple of specific sales processes if we can stick them in the resources. Yeah. All right, but the, the person who asked that question, watch, because I'm going to now um, go back into module four. A great way to pick up one-to-one -one clients is going to local business networking events. Now, unless you're in maybe sort of the third world, most areas around the world have lots of local business meetings. If you're in property, there are lo often lots of local property meetings. Business club, business for breakfast, 4N, you know, all these franchise ones, and then maybe the action coaches. Let's have a, a let's find some more of those and put them in the resources. Yeah, there's some great ones. I, yeah. There's lots of Etsy fairs and stuff. So Etsy yeah. fairs, there's um, Angels Den and London Business Angels for raising joint venture finance. There's loads. I mean, just a quick down and dirty research on Google will find them. You know, type in your area and then property networking events, type in your area, business networking events, type in your area. Um, general networking type in your area raising finance networking angel events there's loads of them now if you go to those you will pick up clients because you're meeting people face to face you're exchanging cards you're looking into their eyes you're speaking to them for five or ten minutes and so you've broken down a lot of the barriers uh, that people have of trusting you now the very first business networking event i ever went to was called the business club in peterborough now i got really lucky with networking because the first property one i ever went to uh, I met Mark Homer, my now current business partner. We've been business partners for 11 years, pretty much. Uh, and we've bought over 700 properties, or we've managed 700. We own, or co-own, over 500. And I met him at the very first property networking event. And he was the last person I networked with. And, it was, and I was very naive and green, and probably wasn't a great networker. And I was a bit nervous about talking to people. I had these crappy business cards that clearly looked like I just, you know, made them up myself. Uh, but... I met him there. Three months later, we bought our first property, and about a year in, we bought we, we had about twenty together. And now our business interests are worth you know in the tens of millions of pounds a year. So that really worked. And then the first business event that I went to, I created this little um, sort of scripted sales pitch. Let's see if I can remember. I haven't used it for years. We save you time and make you money by building and managing a hands-free property portfolio that you could retire on freeing you up for more financial and time independence. So I refined that and tested that over, you know, uh, uh, got some feedback off a few people and, and, and memorized it. And I haven't said that for years and it just came out of my brain just then. 
So, you know, these business networking events, you get a chance to stand up and do your 20 or 30 second pitch. So when you do that, make it very focused on the result and the outcome and the individual. So what I didn't say is I buy a load of properties and, um, you know, I will help you get a tenant uh, and I will look after the property for you. I said we save you time and make you money by building and managing a hands-free property portfolio that you could retire on, freeing your time uh, and financial independence. So it's very focused on the outcome and the result. And a lot of people go to networking events, and that's a good step, uh, but they don't uh, really sell very well the thing that they do, and so people don't approach them. Now, of course, if you approach people, that'll work. Um, but if you can get people to approach you, then that's very powerful. So definitely stand up and get your 20 seconds in and get a really um, sexy, intriguing, focused on the listener um, pitch. Now, when we did that, a chap came up to me called Lyndon, said, oh, Rob, you're in property. That sounds interesting. Tell me about it. And we had a discussion. And I think we bought him 15 or so properties. Still got them today. Still, you know, done really well out of them. He's become a really good friend. This was in 2006, right at the start. And he's, he's been working with us on our IT and managing some of our um, websites ever since too. So we made a lot of money for each other and with each other by, you know, exchanging the services. Now, he paid us and we paid him. And because, we, you know, we, we could afford to and we thought that was a good thing to do. But we could have done a contra thing where he could have managed all of our websites and we could have sourced him a couple of properties. So if you haven't got a lot of money yet, you could do contra services. But that was the very first local business meeting we ever went to. And that was really good. Now, of course... For about the first 18 months of growing our business, we were doing two or three of these a week, and we were getting most of our leads from these, and these, this built us to a high six-figure business. That's really our only, only, only lead generation strategy. When we got into Google AdWords, and when we sort of maybe you know, felt that we were a bit too busy, and maybe we, we wanted to scale and go more one-to-many, we stopped going into networking events, and we moved into Google AdWords pay-per-click, and you know, now social media, so we can scale out more, you know, having YouTube channels, writing books, doing podcasts. And that probably takes us nicely on to moving to the one-to-many. So I'm going to list some ways you can do one-to-many selling. So uh, you want to get your pen and paper out and right now or your device and make a list of these. So number one, you want to get into public speaking. Because public speaking through delivering your own information products, YouTube, podcasts, audible books... Um, transcriptions written into physical books, transcriptions that we're speaking into blogs, all the other resources we gave you, I think module one or two. Uh, if you can't speak, was it module three? Yeah, we can't, you won't be able to sell anything if you can't speak publicly and you won't be able to leverage all of these social media channels and the live feed videos unless you can, you've got a basic understanding of public speaking. So that's the first thing. The next thing is, once you've got, once you've got a couple of staff, send them to all the local networking events. Get them to use your systems and processes and teach them the scripted networking sales pitch. And then they can do the selling for you. The next thing is expo, expos and, you know, the big shows. In, in nearly every niche has big shows at London Excel or, you know, they have the exhibitions where most of the industry leaders go to. You'll find them online. Make sure you go to all of yours um, in your niche and maybe a bit wider. So we'll go to the franchise show because it's kind of business, even though we don't have franchises. We'll go to the giveaway business cards and probably did a few little cheeky things, you know, trying to get a bit of business there. And, you know, we weren't breaking any laws. Uh, and then when we can afford to have exhibitions and then you can do all the, the public speaking slots that are on a lot of them, then you get some income in business. And then as you scale up, you get your staff to go and do that for you. So you don't have to do it. Make sure you're set up on and active on all the social media profiles that I mentioned to you in the previous module. So check all of them off. There'll be new ones in the future too. The next thing is doing joint ventures. So someone might have a database. Let's say that you're, let's say you're, um, you're, your online course is how to leverage and outsource more, you know, the life leverage philosophy. And let's say there's a personal development speaker. Uh, you know, he has a database of 60,000 people in the UK and you have this product or service. You can ask them to promote your product or service to their subscription database. And in return, you can give them 50% of the proceeds of the sale of the product that you sell on the webinar that they promote or on the, the sales or landing page that they all go to. Uh, alternatively, you could pay them a one-off fee. That's called CPA or media buying. 
So you could pay them a thousand pound to send one's promotional email to their 60,000 database or whatever you could negotiate as a price, or you pay them nothing, but you give them half the profits. Now, when we started in 2008 doing books and training on our business, and when we iterated from buying properties for people into writing and information and material, um, our first book, Property Investing Secrets, uh, we did a joint venture with a big personal development guy at the time who had a database of 65,000 people in the UK. Now, he sent our book to his database. We sold hundreds of copies of that book off one email. And we had this flood of incoming leads that we'd never experienced before. And I actually managed to agree to, to, for him to do that for free. And then what we did is we sent an email to our considerably smaller database. So a bit of kudos for me getting that deal. But I did a lot for them. I did a lot of their courses. I went and was um, uh, I got interviewed on their stages as their testimonials. So I gave them value too. And then we sent information about their events to our database. And we got equal mutual benefit out of that. And that gave us a massive boost because we were leveraging off the back of his profile. And of course, he was able to offer his products and services to our clients too. So that's, a J, that, that's called joint ventures. There are so many people in your industry in your niche that could be collaborative not competitive but also outside of your niche like you know personal development people might, might, might want to know about outsourcing and leverage property people might not might want to know about it public speakers might want to know about it general business people might want to know about it you know the people that are more into spirituality might want to know about it so you can it with the good thing about it being cross niche but sort of dovetails is it's not competitive Need a, need a sip. Any other questions? Or again? Yeah. What's the? Um, how do you know the tipping point when you should move and transition from one to one to one to many? Okay. You should put that bottle under the table. Yeah. I tell you what. Um. I, don't let. Look, I, let me answer that at the end. Yep. So at the end of this module, don't let me forget it because yep. uh, it's a good question. But I'm in the middle of the yep. one to many. The thing I love about the disruptive, ever-changing world so fast at the speed of light now is the opportunities come about um, way quicker than they used to. So in, in sort of the information marketing world, the sort of the old way of sharing business was joint ventures to email databases, as I just mentioned. But the new way is if someone has a Facebook group with 10,000 people in that group and you have a Facebook group, they might promote your book on their Facebook group and you might promote their book on your Facebook group. So you're going to have a Facebook group or Facebook followers um, promotions and joint ventures. A lot of people now are going and doing live feed videos on other people's um, followers and fans. So Tony Robbins just did one interviewed with Gary Vaynerchuk. I know Tim Ferriss did one, I think, for Business Insider. So if someone's got a bigger following than you, you can go and give really good value to their following, and be videoed by them on a live feed video on their profile, and then you can get a lot of benefit for that too. Podcast joint ventures. A lot of people now, when they're promoting their books, Sarah Blakely just did it because she's bringing out a new book and she's got a great story. She's a billionaire s. She set up the Spanx brand. And when she, when she was launching her new book, I noticed she was being interviewed on loads of these podcasts. So if you're launching something new that's valuable, then podcast hosts and interviewers may have you interviewed on their podcast. Vice versa, if you have a podcast, you might be able to pull in really good interviewees for your podcast. I know a lot of people um, do paid deals. A lot of podcast interviewers or people who have big followings on Facebook or Instagram, they will pay to tweet something or post something or do a live feed or do an interview. Christian Ronaldo gets paid, I think, nearly 300,000 euros a tweet. Now, of course, you know, if he like maybe tweets about his Adidas boots or whatever brand he endorses, Rory Macker will be getting paid loads of money for endorsing Bose or Nike. Now, of course, this might be a smaller scale for you, but the concept is still the same. You can offer them a, a one pay option or you pay them up front. Now, of course, if you're starting your business, you might prefer to pay them on share of sales. As you grow your business, it might be cheaper to pay them up front. I often get asked, at what point should you move from one to one to one to many? Well, refer back to what I said earlier in the module. You should absolutely get the processes, the systems, the manuals, the script, everything in your head out live now and as quick as possible. At the point where you lose the love for selling because you've sold so many of them, done it for so long, or 
you need to manage and lead rather than sell. Or you've got some aggressive growth targets. Or the market changes. Or you need variety in your business. They're the points at which you should probably go from one to one to one to many. But I would say be proactive rather than reactive. If you control the narrative and you go from you selling one to one to either you selling one to many or other people selling one to one before um, be other people selling one to one for you. There you go. I'm going to get it in the end. If you control when that happens, it's less reactive, less stressful to you has less collateral damage to your family and your personal life, you're less exposed to risk or changes in the market. So I did get asked on the live feed video just now, when should you go from one to one to one to many? I think sooner than you want to, sooner than you're planning to, and so that you can control moving across so that you can test it. Because you know, if you need to go one to many because you're about to have a nervous breakdown, for example, and you need other people to sell for you, well, you're gonna be so busy doing it because you need to do it to keep the sales going, you're not gonna have time to train this person and they're asking you for time and you're like, well, go away because I'm so busy. And you know, therefore, then they're not gonna get up to speed quickly. You're gonna, or you're gonna chuck them in the fire and give them a really good lead and they're gonna burn it. They need a bit of practicing, a bit of role playing, you know, maybe selling to a couple of clients that maybe not as good at leads yet, maybe a bit colder to give them a little bit of practice. And you want that happening in the background. You don't want to sort of switch to them to so a bit like if you're creating a new version of your website and you make it live and it's all broken, it doesn't work, that's going to cause you problems. Now, something that nearly everyone doesn't do, that doesn't cost any money, that's really easy, that you can do, do it now, promise me you'll do it, is at the point of sale, or soon after the point of sale, the point at which your client is feeling good about the product or service, ask for three referrals. Ask them specifically, do they know between one and three people who really may, may be able to benefit from the product or service that they're getting, can they put you in touch? Can they give you a name, email, or phone number? Now, if you ask them before they uh, sign on the dotted line, that's a bit presumptuous, if you ask them, Later down the line, they may be, might be colder or they might have forgotten how good the product or service was. So at the point of sale and or at the point when your client is the happiest, you want to ask them for one to three referrals. If you do, imagine if every three clients referred one person, then you are getting one in four clients free with no marketing spend. And by the way, they'll be the easiest to sell and the cheapest to manage because they've already got a relationship with the person that they bought from you. Good, yeah. Um, could you do a little bit more on how great referrals are? Because they're fucking awesome. And, you know, basically, like you said, like that, but once you've got to a certain size, referrals are like self-perpetuating cycle. I think they're like one of the key kind of golden nuggets that once right. you get to a certain size, you okay. can push on it. As you grow your business, it's gonna be harder for you to personally ask for referrals. Uh, we have something called an ambassador program. So we have someone, Steph, who works in the team full time, and this is her full time job. So she is looking in all of our communities. She lets everyone know that we have an ambassador program where they can recommend our products and services and introduce people to us. They get a nice commission. Some of them just want to introduce people. So we don't always, it doesn't have to be commission based. Some people just want to do it because they've got a good service. Other people probably only do it because they get paid a nice commission. There are many people who can earn 10,000 pounds or more just at one of our events by referring uh, you know, a few of their friends. Some people do it kind of like, oh, I know a few friends, and other people do it because they've got a database and they do it more as an affiliate marketer. But you, know, you take it from you asking for recommendations to it being a more systemized, scaled thing. Now, a great book on this is How to Sell Anything to Anybody by Joe Girard. Get on that book. Now, I used to think, well, I thought, let me just cut that out, and just stop before I used to think. I just moved that bottle as well. I didn't say that though. It's what takes us from outbound to inbound marketing, which is where you yeah. want to be. Okay. Now, when I got the book for the first time, I thought this was a book on selling, and I was like, oh, I'm going to learn to sell a lot better reading this book by Joe Girard, who's in the world record for uh, books for selling the most amount of cars ever by a mile. And it's actually a referral book. It's a book of how to build a network of incoming business. So. He goes to his dealership and he sells, I think, 40 to 50 cars a month from everyone just walking in going, I want to speak to Joe Girard. Now, of course, that doesn't happen overnight, but you get this inbound pull 
of leads when you have a really good ambassador or a you know, client referral program. Uh, and I would definitely, it's probably the best form of marketing because it's the most trust and this is the least objections you have to come through. And as you build your business, you can get it to the point where um, you don't really have to spend anything on marketing. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't, but you can certainly have a, just a referral-based business, but I don't know many people who have a just a pay-per-click business. Cool. All right. Um, just a couple of questions, and then if you want to do a quick wrap-up and thank you. Okay, yeah. All right, I've actually got a quick story. I'll do that first. Yeah, go for it. Now, one of my mentors, a very famous man, uh, probably one of the leading personal development human behaviour experts in the world, told me this great story of something he did uh, when he had a, uh, a, a, his doctor's practice. Uh, and not doctor as in surgeon, but you know he was a, a doctor, a, a psychologist of sorts. And he used to have patients come in and they'd walk down the hallway and there'd be this huge wall. And on this huge wall was um, what he called the tree of life. And so he'd um, go and have his patient and then as he was walking back, he would stop his patient and say, um, your name and no one who you know their name. Fuck bollocks. I'll start again on that because I'm talking a load of rubbish. Lie. <laughs> one of my mentors told me a story of something he did, which I want to share with you because I think this could really grow your referral business. He called it the tree of life. And um, in his office on a huge wall, he had a tree where he would write the name of a client and then a branch off parts of the tree would be someone that that client referred and then a branch off the branch would be someone that that person referred and a branch of a branch of a branch of a branch would be someone that that person referred. And imagine how powerful it is seeing thousands of names on a wall of everyone who's ever been a client and then referred a client and referred a client and referred a client and referred a client. And referred a client. I mean, if you just saw that, you know, when you, as a client, when you get asked to refer people, there's amazing social proof there that it's a good thing to refer people and you're going to get looked after. And it was so powerful. What he used to do when he used to go and see his patients is he'd come back afterwards and he'd say, have I disappointed you in some way? I mean, if I let you down, do you not, you know, do you not like my service? You know, while he was looking at the tree of life on his wall. And of course, I'd go, oh, no, 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 everything's, everything's fine. And I go, you know, it's great because your name's not on there and you've not referred anyone to me. And um, if people don't refer people to me, it means I haven't done my job and they haven't given you a great service. And what I would love to see more than anything is, you know, your name and some of your friends who could really get benefit and help from me, their name's also being on the tree. So do you know anyone who I could help? And I just thought that was a great visual representation. And then what you've got to do after that, of course, is you've got to track it. So if you don't have the back-end systems or a member of staff or a spreadsheet tracking every name, then this is gonna break because there's nothing more powerful than someone receiving a check they didn't expect from you because you did some business with someone they referred. There is nothing worse for a client who referred people to never hear from you or never get paid or even hear from their friends that they bought your product or service and then never got paid. And when you start sending checks out to people, it's the most powerful thing you can do to grow your business. And honestly, get a check out to someone Sometimes I'll pay people a check um, that maybe they it wasn't sure if it was their client and I'll just pay it anyway because I know they're going to refer to me over and above and beyond what is more powerful than getting a check you didn't expect in the past. That was a really good example. All right, cool. Um, so just two quick questions. Mm -hmm. One is pretty good, I think. Um, how important is it to diversify your sales channels as you grow? Okay. How important is it to diversify... How important is it to divert? Pop this well. Right, mum. How important is it to diversify your sales channels? Is as important is it? Um, how important is it to diversify your sales channels? Well, if you recall to the previous model where I said it's really important to diversify your marketing channels, it's also important to diversify your sales channels. If you have one salesperson and they're bloody awesome and they're bringing all your money and then they're off for three months because they want to go on a sabbatical, or they get ill, or they get stressed, or they leave and set up progressing property or unlimiting success, or they set up a book called Wife Leverage, you know, or whatever, you know, they model you and rip you off, you're screwed. 
So just one salesperson, just one sales channel is risky. But you have to start one and get it to work before you can then scale to the next one and get it to work and the next one to get it to work. So what you do, just to repeat the process one more time and help you scale it is, you might start the selling, you systemize, record and scriptize and automate everything, um, man get everything written down about your sales process. You teach a salesperson that, they start your selling, then you get them to get a protege and they teach a protege, so then there's two of them, and then you might get automated sales processes like recorded webinars and recorded um, voicemails, and yeah, and then you build this multi-channel program. Of course, you go, you get some of your staff to go to exhibitions, like I mentioned, and you get some of your staff to go to networking events, and then you build these multiple channels of sales, which is just as important as multiple channels of marketing. Cool. Final quick one, which I want to be more a bridge to the resources, so just use it as a reason to say that we've got all these extra resources, is about like, I'm passionate about my product, but I'm terrible at public speaking, I have no confidence, how do I learn to sell? So mainly just use, answer okay. it short, but then bridge to, we're going to do supplementary right. information about this, okay. so we can then do stuff for ESD and stuff. Yeah. What happens if you're passionate about your product and service and you can do it more than anyone? You're a great coder hacker. You can create any kind of software, but you're not really a salesperson. Well, you've got a few options. Number one, learn, because selling is one of the most vital skills in the world. And you know what? You can take everything from me. My fancy watches, my fancy cars, my fancy house, you know, my, my ego, you know, all my business. And as long as you can't lobotomize my brain, and take away everything I learned, I feel confident I could start again, and as long as I believe in my product or service, I could build another multi-million pound business, and every person who's ever created a business that's been good at selling has had that same feeling too. And You know, Steve Jobs, great salesman. Elon Musk, great salesman. And you know, you don't have to be a, a yucky salesman, like a, you know, a really suited and booted and slick, um, kind of pushy salesman. You know, that's a bit outdated. Some of the best salespeople in the world, Mahatma Gandhi, Oprah Winfrey, you know, all these people, they're great at selling a vision. So, um, number one, learn. Number two, learn good ways to be good at selling, i.e. strategy, vision, inspiration and leadership, not um, yucky, pushy techniques. Number three is partner with someone in your business who is good at selling and you do the creation and they do the sales and marketing. And to be honest, in most businesses, that's a different type of person and a, a completely different department and a different function. Nothing wrong with that. I know loads of people who are great at creating products, but not good at selling them. And salespeople are often really not good at admin and creation and tweaking and iteration, but they, they, you know, they're good at giving the vision, the dream, selling the outcome, the benefits. So that, that's the third thing. The fourth thing is you don't necessarily have to learn how to be an amazing salesperson, but maybe you just have to learn how to speak well and communicate well. Uh, and of course, there are many resources. We'll put some of the resources for maybe some of the best sales books and some of the best public speaking books and audio programs. In fact, we have our own public speaking training. Let's put them in the resources so people can follow up on that. But one way or another, you've got to get good at selling. And there's nothing wrong with selling. And if you're, you know, if you're not getting a bit of critique and feedback, oh, well, they're a bit salesy, they send a bit too few too many emails, oh, they're a bit persistent. If you're not getting any of that, you're not selling enough. Doesn't have to be you, it has to be someone in your team. Great answer, thank you. All right. If you want to do a quick Wicked. wrap up, thanks for watching module four. See you on the next module. Don't forget to check the supplementary material. Okay. So thank you for watching. So thank you for watching, listening, following module four. Look forward to sharing module five with you. Don't forget to get yourself through the supplementary material and the resources that are all part of the Business Income Builder program. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thanks for everyone tuning in.